In this video, we're meeting two bright young engineers who head up global cold weather testing operations for General Motors, and we're going to hear their best advice, experiences, and tips for aspiring engineers and upcoming engineering students pursuing a one-of-a-kind job in automotive tech. Now let's visit GM's cold weather testing team leads, and we're going to Capus Gasing. Lately, General Motors is selling about 6 to 8 million vehicles per year to customers around the entire planet. And whether we're talking small cars, big trucks, or an increasing number of all-electric vehicles coming to market in the near future, every one of those needs to be able to meet certain customer expectations across a wide range of conditions. Enter the engineers. First, they design the vehicles and all of the thousands of parts and systems inside, from turbochargers to batteries to infotainment. Then, they set off testing and torturing their creations, looking for areas where improvements can be made. Weather-related testing is a big part of the process. In addition to a multitude of other requirements, car and truck parts need to perform flawlessly, even at extreme temperatures. That's the reality when you sell Chevrolet Bolts and Cadillac Escalades and GMC Sierras to customers from the Arctic Circle to California and all points in between. And so, in Ontario's north, General Motors operates a major cold weather testing center used as part of their global toolkit of engineering and development facilities around the world. A nine-hour drive north from Toronto, Capus Casing is surrounded by the wilderness of northern Ontario and blessed with something that cold weather test engineers love, lots of frigid temperatures. So this facility and the people who work here play a major role in GM's product lineup. The Cold Weather Testing Center in CAP is home to a team of engineers testing drivers and all manner of advanced equipment deployed to hunt down and neutralize problems caused by cold before a given vehicle ever goes into production. And at the test center, vehicles are driven around the clock. Every kilometer traveled by these test vehicles generates data that's useful to the engineers and ultimately helps GM's teams make cars and trucks that stand up better to the cold. But this isn't a story about cold weather testing, really. Instead, it's a story about two of the youngest engineers I've ever met and the academic path that they took through high school and onwards to one-of-a-kind jobs that involve extreme weather testing of prototype vehicles and systems that the general public won't even learn about for years. I asked Connor Sutton and Matthew Adams to tell us a little more about what they do and also to share some of their best stories, advice, and tips for students hoping to pursue a similar career path, and I'll highlight some of those for you now. Remember, this video is a summary of a much more in-depth article and interview that you'll find over on driving.ca, so be sure to check that out for much more information. So for me, a uh, brief overview of a typical day. Um, we start relatively early in the morning. Again, we have two shifts of drivers that come in, and so that starts at 8 a.m. and it goes all the way through to the early morning hours. Uh, so we have a very brief window of time early in the morning where we can actually go out. We show up to work, me and my team, and we can go out, we can look at those vehicles while they're not actively on test to kind of look through some of the issues. We look through comments that our driving staff had left for us to say like, hey, we noticed this was going on with the vehicle, what's going on with that. We go out there and investigate any sort of feedback we get from our driving staff or our mechanics or whoever it happens to be, things we've noted ourselves. Um, and so yeah, that's a brief window of time until the driving staff shows up and then the vehicles are out on test. Um, from there on out for those issues that you know we've identified, we start working basically collaboratively uh, with engineers who could be located globally, depending on what the issue is on the vehicle, right? Um, so we reach out to those specific teams that work on, you know, whatever the component is or the software is, whatever it happens to be, to get an understanding of like what it's, how it's supposed to be functioning and what we're actually seeing and whether or not we've actually got an issue on our hands. And all of a sudden it's these huge groups of engineers that are coming together to try and solve this problem to make sure it's not going to be making its way into production. So it can be fast paced, it can be exciting, um, and you can be the one that can stand there and say that, you know, you were the one that found that issue. So um, it's a cool job. Yeah. That day to day can, you know, depend depending on, you know, how, how Connor, if Connor's team is running into issues, are we having issues with our driving, you know, some of our driving staff or not the staff themselves, but say our driving operations are having issues, um, working on, you know, capital plans and forward looking elements to the site. Um, I would say the, like, 
a good day for me is um, being able to see the successes of people on the site and knowing like that I help enable them to get them. Like when, when Connor's team has those like big fine moments or you know, we, we have wins across any area of the site, knowing that like I'm helping enable people to, you know, get get everything they want to get done and that I'm able to support them and seeing them grow as, you know, individuals and continuing to further our business here at the site is probably like the best like highlight moments for me. Yeah, so I went to uh, I went to high school at the name of my high school was KLDCS, and so that was in uh, Kirkland Lake, Ontario. So anyone that's uh, familiar with Northern Ontario in the slightest might know of Kirkland Lake, but it's approximately it'd be about six or seven hours north of Toronto. I'll bet you there's probably a lot more options, but when I was going through high school, uh, we had a, basically one option for a robotics class in general there was like one class for programming in general one for robotics depending on where you're going to high school most high schools are going to offer classes you know it might not be robotics exactly but something along those lines of trying to kind of merge between anything mechanical electrical um, software Um, I don't know I, I saw a lot of value in that yeah looking back at high school anything that you can get real hands on experience uh, if it's something that you're unfamiliar with outside of the classroom, that was helpful for me. With all that said, um, like Matt's kind of mentioning, and if you do plan on following down that technical path of going uh, within the area of, say, engineering or you know applied mathematics or anything like that, well, obviously for applied mathematics, but um, they are obviously very uh, math heavy. And I, I don't know if I'd sit here and say that it's necessarily something that you need to that it needs to come to you naturally or anything like that. I've heard it said before that, you know, anyone can uh, can learn to be good at math. I think you just have to find like learning strategies that work for you. I think you could kind of come from either one of those areas of maybe, you know, math comes naturally to you, but you're unsure, you know, what to do with it or where you could actually apply that knowledge. Or similarly, if you do have an interest in, you know, let's say things automotive related or, you know, any sort of those electives that you could take to high school where you can really apply uh, some of that information, you know, you can you can get yourself to a point uh, if you know how you learn that you can get there from the from a math perspective. But with all that said, yeah, if you are going to go down that technical path and you're going to pursue something like engineering, you know, don't expect it to look like a lot of real hands-on you know it's very much theory based through a lot of that schooling so you know mathematics physics thermodynamics things like that depending of course on your discipline uh, those are going to be things that you'd have to expect to be coming across yeah so i i'm from london ontario i guess i went to high school at uh, we call it central secondary school i believe it's formally called london central secondary school I did a lot of like academic courses there. I think probably my, the most interesting to me was physics because that was where I was able to take my like we'll say interest in math and apply it to you know my understanding of you know how some of the things in the world worked around me. Once we could you know take some of those math equations that we get good at in school and you know through physics or particularly like the electrical part, you know apply that to how things in the real world actually happen and some of those you know applied versions of that mathematics i think that really like sunk in with me and really like drove me down the path of you know, working you know through some of that mathematics but in like an applied version like engineering yeah i guess for myself i was definitely a, a math guy all, all the way through like i think one of my favorite extracurriculars in university was i um joined a salsa dancing club so me and a, me and a couple friends learned how to salsa dance during university that will say that's outside of the engineering domain to um you know i was on the solar car sunstang club when i was at western working on a solar car in my spare time uh working a part-time job uh, and going to school i think that was probably the biggest challenge of managing my own time while also trying to balance all those different uh responsibilities do you uh, frequently salsa dance at work just because everyone's going to be wondering now so we bug him he hasn't done it yet. Yeah, with well, some of the uh, COVID protocols we have, I'm not getting a salsa dancing partner anytime soon, Connor. So, um, you know, I wasn't going to be graduating 
with a whole lot of experience in, in the field that I foresaw myself wanting to work in afterwards. So that challenge for me uh, was accepting, and don't get me wrong, I was super excited for it, uh, but I had accepted a job position with GM uh, in between my third and fourth year of university, and that was in Oshawa. So six to seven hours away from uh, my girlfriend at the time after already doing the long distance thing through the entire school year. So. so I think it was a lot of those, you know, extracurriculars, you know, making a big difference in terms of the value of your, you know, your education and experience you're able to bring to the table when looking to gain employment. Like a lot of the things I did in terms of like salsa dancing, solar car, etc. I had started doing in third year of my, you know, what ended up being a five year degree with an internship, but I started doing it at the end of my third year thinking, okay, at this point, I now have you know enough engineering schooling understanding to apply to say like that solar car experience. But I think if I was to do it again, I would definitely you know, get as extracurricularly involved as I felt comfortable or I would have felt comfortable doing earlier because a lot of that experience, it goes back to what Connor and I were talking about earlier around like, you know, Connor's schooling that he enjoyed in high school was a lot about you know that application and in university a lot of extracurriculars in different engineering clubs gives you that application um, opportunities while at university when you might not i don't be at home where you can tinker around with whatever interests you as often right so it sounds like like you know at the end of the day what you're both saying is is you know the school the academic side of it is one part of the journey, but you've had other things in your life and other interests and extracurriculars and so on that have sort of helped um, move you along as well. I only kind of realized later into university is that when it comes to getting experience, and that doesn't need to be just you know co-ops or internships or anything like that. That could be personal projects that you take on. That could be uh, clubs that you join. It could be whatever. Um, but in terms of you know actually getting the experience of applying what you're learning in school, a lot of that will end up falling back on you as a student to take the initiative to do that sort of thing. Those experiences aren't going to be spoon fed to you. That, that's going to be things that you need to seek out. So I think if I get the gist of that is don't wait to get hired before you start applying what you're learning as much as you as you can. No, I, I would I, I think I would echo that. I think very much like, you know, it's a lot of at least from like an employment standpoint not not just generally not speaking specifically about gm but a lot of it for when you know companies look at people from a who are just graduating university they often look at okay like we know you know you you got your degree you know we know you probably did fairly well academically um like what have you done outside to you know show that you you know a have like a, an interest in actually applying what you're learning and b like have demonstrated you know ability to apply that elsewhere and it's it's not just like the technical skills a lot of it's like you know no, knowing how to work as a team um you know knowing how to effectively communicate i mean there's a lot of uh what's often referred to as like soft skills that um, engineering students or just people in engineering um, can benefit from developing whether it's public speaking um, yeah working with others um, project management there's a lot of things that aren't like directly taught in school that aren't all like math and numbers that really help once you uh, like get into a job or get into the field. 